Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Dan Loden. Uh, I coordinate the EWB Challenge, as you probably guessed. Um, and I would like to welcome all guests and delegates to the EWB Challenge Awards for 2009. Um, I'd specifically like to thank and welcome our special guests, J.D. Smith and Buntan Keat from Live and Learn Environmental Ed Education, Phil Clark, Melinda Buckland and Ian Wood from BHP Billiton, and Mr. McMullen, Parliamentary Secretary, who's just spoken before. It's great to have you guys here today. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with the EWB Challenge, it's a first year design course for students which occurs all over Australia, giving students an opportunity to engage in real world problems uh, on problems identified by our community partners. Uh, the program's been running since 2007 and we've had approximately 18,000 students participate in the program. Uh, this year, We've had, we saw seven th more in excess of 7,400 students participate. Just as a quick uh, survey, could anybody who's had anything to do with the EWB challenge um, please raise their hands? Okay, so um, woohoo, that's more than 50%, I think. So it, it, it's, it's a big program that, that, that we run here, which is great to see. Um, Live and Learn Environmental Education are the 2009 EWB challenge. Uh, community partners. Uh, and they've been invaluable in this process. They've been there to uh, involved with the judging process, answering the questions that the students have come up with over the, over the course of the two semesters that it's run, and also helping us develop the, the design brief to come up with the, the problems for the students to try and solve. Um, BHP Billiton is the, the major supporter of the EWV Challenge and has been a supporter since 2008. Uh, their support of the program enables the, the 7,400 students to participate in this program, so that's a really significant contribution. Uh, the EWB Challenge is also supported by Engineers Australia, the Australian Association of Engineering Education, A squared, E squared, it's, I think that's quite cool, a very engineering type name, um, and ACAD, the, Austral uh, the Australian Council of Engineering Deans. Um, this year's team of students worked on uh, projects developed to assist communities on and around the Tonley South. So for those of you unfamiliar who haven't seen JD and Buntan's uh, presentations, uh, the, the Tonley South River is based in Cambodia. It's a, f it's a lake that changes in height significantly and the people living on, on this, this lake have to deal with a whole range of issues that are very unique to their situation because they are floating. So, each uh, university, uh, the, the project areas that they covered were range from uh, energy, information and communication technology, uh, waste management, sanitation, you can obviously imagine being a big, big issue, and access to clean water. Uh, we had a total of 76 submissions from 24 universities across Australia and New Zealand. Um, the, the reports were reviewed by an external judging panel, which uh, we were in. Uh, careful deliberations last night to determine who got what prizes. Very interesting process we went through there. Um, from the presentations that were done Friday down here and also some of them upstairs in lecture room three. So some of the people here you would have already seen those presentations as well. Um, I would especially like to thank the tireless work of the judging panel. They had to review a really large number of reports coming into this and then uh, obviously participating in, in the, the judging process today and yesterday. Um, our distinguished panel of judges are Mr. Philip Clark from BHP Billiton, Mr. J.D. Smith from Live and Learn Environmental Education, Mr. Buntan Keat from Live and Learn Environmental Education, Mr. Rebecca Ru Russell from Engineers Without Borders, Mr. Darren Pace uh, from Engineers Australia, and Dr. Leslie Jolly from the University of Queensland. I would also like to congratulate the top six teams. It's an amazing achievement just to be one of the top six teams selected out of 7,400 students, so just getting here is, is an amazing achievement, I think. Uh, today, all students will receive outstanding achievement awards for just making it this far. In addition, awards will be presented for the Best Poster Award, which some of you may have seen yesterday during lunch, the BHP Award for Sustainable Design and Community Engagement, and the overall EWB Challenge Champion Award. I'll now hand over to Leslie Jolly and Buntan to provide some feedback on the quality of the, the submissions and present the Outstanding Achievement Awards. I'll just ask you to speak into there, but the mic, this is the mic, that's just for the video recorder. Right. 
Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, we went through a, a process which felt quite long at times of reading the shortlisted 20 that Dan had selected for us uh, to read the reports. These were all marked against standard kinds of academic criteria. How good was the engineering solution? How good was the process they went through to get to that solution? What was the ethical uh, position of this solution? Did it to pay proper attention to environmental and social impacts? And finally, how good, how professional was the report? For the six teams that you're going to meet in a minute, they all did really terrific. What can you say? Uh, it was very impressive, the level of work that was done both at a technical level and a professional report writing uh, level. So well done to everybody. That was really outstanding. Then we came and we watched them give their presentation in front of people, which is, of course, terrifically scary. And again, um, we saw really good professional work coming out of these very young engineers. It bodes terrifically well for the future. But if we think we had a hard job, we're aware that some of the students in particular were going through even worse. I mean, all of you had to do the actual work, right? But um, some of you were in the middle of exams when you had to come down here and give your presentation, the students from, I think, Flinders and Edith Cowan. Uh, so to those students, a, a very big thank you for making that commitment and, uh, and doing that. In the end, we talked long and hard round about how do you split the hairs here over who's going to be uh, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, because they're all so good. The good news is, and you're going to find out the answer in a minute, and I'm not going to tell you, um, <laughs> we had to make a decision among six very good projects, and we've done that. But live and learn can have a, a wider remit. They're not tied to the same criteria we were looking at. And they have the ability to say, that idea and that idea, they're really good. Might need some development. You know, maybe their report wasn't quite so good or something like that. But it's a great idea and we can pick it up. This happened with a sponsor last year where um, there was a terrific idea. Didn't get to the last six but the sponsor picked up that idea and has decided to develop it further in their programs. So for all the 20 and for the staff who I know give such a lot of support to these students of all that 20, all is not yet lost. Your idea may yet be taken up and you should all be proud of yourselves for what you've achieved. Thank you. Uh, Lisa, can you present the, can you read out the universities and then I'll get the students to come down so it's fine. Mm -hmm. I, and I left my glasses back okay. in my chair. Um, <laughs> Curtin University Communal Anchored Storm Protection. Okay. The first High Achievement Award goes to Curtin University. The team were working on a project for communal anchored storm protection attachments for houses on the lake. Yeah. So if you just want to read out their names as well. So, um, okay. Um, uh, come on down, guys. <laughs> come on out. Their so. names are... <laughs> Carl Davis. Caden Dennis. Megan De Piazzi. Philip Lawrence. Oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> There's always one stuff up, but <laughs> there is a certificate for you, so. Uh, so what was your name? Young. 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 Yeah. Congratulations. Uh, yeah, just, 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 just. Thank you. <laughs> so the next team is Murdoch University and Battery Life. The next team is Murdoch University, who had a project looking at maintaining the life of batteries used for in-house electricity supply. Up. The first. Um, <laughs> do you want to jump over this side, Bentley? There you go. 
The first name is Mark Casson. Wilson Lamb. Dennis Jayasundra. And Greg Krebin, who couldn't be here. From Edith Cowan University, we had a team working on water sanitation in the Tonle Sap. Could those, that team come down? <laughs> and they are Natalia Yud, Ashton White, Michael Smagiasi, James Nicholson, Joshua Elliott, Ryan Cooper. Oh, that's uh, Chris Cornell, that's fine. That's it. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Thanks, Leslie and Buntan. Um, I'm now going to ask uh, Mr. Bob McMullen to come and present the poster award uh, to stage. Just need to walk into there. Yeah, I, I haven't spoken much too much, so I don't intend to make a speech. I'm just going to present the award. Uh, but uh, I think this is a fantastic thing that you're all doing, and I'm delighted to be associated with it. But you don't need to hear me anymore. Let me make the presentation. Yeah. So it's uh, Flinders University Flooding Rain Project. So the, the winners are from the Flinders University. A prize here for Laura Bell. For Steve Wilkin. For Darren Halliday. And for Bryce Beam. Is this a colleague of yours who isn't here? Is it? Okay, can you take that for him? Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Bob. Okay, uh, moving right along, the next award is the BHP Billiton Award, so I'll ask Mr. Phil Clark to come to the stage. Thanks, Dan. Um, there's nothing like standing between a group and lunch, is there? So <laughs> we'll, we'll move on pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> Look, BHP is really pleased to be involved once again in this award. It's fantastic um, uh, to be part of it. Uh, we've been involved with, uh, with uh, well, Dan and Dan for, for some time. Um, so it, it's just great to be, to be part of it, so that's there. Um, the BHP award uh, this year, I think it's probably, uh, I'll, I'll put it this way. Um, it's elegant in its design. It's, it's, it's simple, um, which is what uh, one part that we liked about it. It's, it's very low cost, and that allows it to be, go, to, to be uh, given to the poorest of the poor in the region. So uh, this year's goes to, uh, to Curtin University uh, for the uh, integrated bamboo catchment system. Yeah. And we have awards for uh, Nidra. Oh, there's two. You get two. You yeah. get your standing achievement, the BHP one. You yeah. get the two together. And to uh, Debbie. Yeah, thank you. And Samuel. And Paul. And to Christopher. Thank you very much. Well done. Excellent. This is for your first four Thanks, Thanks, So that obviously just leaves the overall champion award. So I'd like to ask uh, Mr. J.D. Smith to the stage to present the overall champion award. Uh, hi there, everybody. Um, I feel like Bob McMullen should be a bit of my PR man, even though he's leaving now. <laughs> 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 uh, thanks for the wrap. Um, <laughs> I, I was one of those Australian volunteers that then worked for the United Nations and then finally found a, a sensational NGO to work for. I work for Live and Learn Environmental Education. And I think one of the other things for good NGOs is we, we partner with other good NGOs. And we've been incredibly lucky to work with EWB over the last three years. And over the last year, we've been really fortunate to work with Anne and Dan on the EWB Challenge. It's been an amazing process. and. 
This morning we heard Don talking about that hope budget. And I tell you, being one of the, ju the judges over the last few days and during the year, it really does help build your hope. You see all these students doing amazing work, incredible ideas, really stunning reports. It, it really is something to keep giving us hope. There's a, a lot of hope out there because I, I do know that it is difficult sometimes, but we, we've got to keep being inspired and keep the energy levels up so that we can inspire others. Um, so that, that's probably enough from me. I'll just go straight to the fact that we have an overall winner, which is uh, UWA with the uh, biodigestation in Cambodia. <laughs> Uh, one for Ian. Uh, Louise. Patrick. Reese. Yep. Martin. Robbie. That's it. That's it. Where's the course corner? Is that everyone? Yep. So um, we'd really like to give them another round of applause and ask them to give a, a quick presentation so that you all have a better understanding about uh, what the idea they had was and, and how they've um, gone through reporting on it. So we'll hand over to you guys now. Yes, yeah. yeah. speaking to that. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. I did prepare this earlier, so. <laughs> <laughs> Improper waste management in the Tommy Sap region is a serious problem, leading to a high rate of disease propagation and contraction, and an overall decrease in the quality of life there. As a solution to this problem, we believe anaerobic digestion is a feasible option, with an ability to uniformly decrease pathogens and process waste effectively. Our design is an aquatic adaptation of proven land-based technology entailing a five metre long polyethylene cylinder, 800 millimetres in diameter, with an inlet, outlet, and centrally located gas collection point. The digester processes all organic wastes, producing a usable effluent in the form of a liquid fertiliser. This can be used locally in farming or in an aquaponic setup. Additionally, biogas is produced, composing primarily of methane, which can be used for cooking and lighting. Sleeves on either side of the digester were developed to distribute load and maintain bad integrity. Sorry. Our group believes that cultural sensitivity is extremely important and sought to produce a solution which would be well received by the locals. In this way, we ensured our design would be easily integrated into current housing infrastructure in the Tollingsat region, with ideally the inlet being connected to existing drop toilets and the digester floating underneath the house. We successfully built a prototype in an environment that reflected that of the Tollingsat region. And we're able to sustain a flame and boil water after 37 days of operation. This proves that our design is not simply a concept, but it's a reality. It's imperative that ongoing support and education is provided to the Tollingsat residents for this technology to be successfully implemented. We envisage an NGO such as Live and Learn providing this support. Finally, it's particularly humbling that an idea we developed and put so much effort into has the potential to make a real difference for someone's life. We would sincerely like to extend our gratitude to EWB and the supporting partners like BHP, Live and Learn and UWA for providing us this valuable learning opportunity. Thank you very much. Well done, Dad. Well done. Well done. You guys sit down now, too. Run, 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 run. Quick, go, 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 go. So now I'm going to hand over to JD. He's going to talk briefly about um, the benefits that Live and Learn see from participating in the EWB Challenge and introduce our 2010 EWB Challenge partner. Thanks, Sam. Um, well, for Live and Learn, uh, we, we have had an ongoing partnership with EWB, but I, I have to say it's like we won the award. Um, <laughs> Live and Learn has benefited so much. The, the ideas, the reports, it's such a wealth of knowledge. Um, so 
it really does help an organisation like us. Uh, live and learn, we really focus on the education side of things. But education without action, it's no good. It just doesn't work. So that's where the partnership with EWB has been so important. And through the challenge, we're bringing in um, new minds, new ideas, uh, fresh approaches to things, because the, there's, a, there's a lot of things out there that we need to be doing. A lot of it's pretty simple, but you need good minds to make simple things work. And, and that's one of the toughest things to get across to people is that it's not the really difficult solutions that we're after. It's about people who can explain these simple solutions so that we can get on with it. And, and I think that's a lot of what's come through the reports we've seen. They're, they're not the most complex ideas, but they've been simplified. They're, they've been made in a way that we can look at them and as EWB with Live and Learn in Cambodia, we can start to try some of these things and actually do it in the field. So that's, that's really why I feel like Live and Learn's been a bit of a winner from this whole challenge process. And I'm really honoured in um, handing over to the Kuma tr traditional landowners because I feel like you guys are the next winners in this whole process. <laughs> so um, next year it's going to southwest Queensland and Cheryl Buchanan and the the Kuma traditional landowners, I, I think you're in for a wonderful year. Um, it is a lot of hard work though when they throw all these judging things to you. <laughs> yeah, they really make you work don't, for a while. Don't tell them, no, no. <laughs> but in the end, it's all really great. So I want to wish you guys a lot of success next year and I look forward to hearing about how it all goes as well. So um, congratulations on getting it for next yeah. year. Thanks. Yeah. Cheryl, did you want to come up and say a couple of words about the shearing shed? <laughs> and remembering everybody wants to go to lunch. <laughs> oh, so I talk for an hour? Yeah, okay. Just under an hour if possible. <laughs> okay. um, firstly, congratulations to all of you. Um, I love young people. Uh, it's a reminder that I was young once, which uh, <laughs> kind of diminishes as you start to get older and older and the, you know, the grey hairs start to come. Uh, the, the idea of the challenge being um, on Kuma lands is very exciting because um, it will introduce people to um, red earth country, part of Australia, Mulga lands. And the challenge there is that we have, uh, as you know, been involved in the last nine years in getting our country back and only been there for nine years on our traditional uh, lands. And we have this huge infrastructure um, that needs to become um, a learning place, a community centre, whatever it is that, you know, the, the young students decide it can be. The challenge out there is the heat, you know. Um, our people were actually shearers in the shearing shed, which is the uh, challenge. And um, the shearing shed, and I remember my um, cousin sister, who's a wool classer, ring me up one time uh, when she was out at Murramurra doing the last wool clip. It was 52 degrees in that shearing shed, 52 degrees, and I'm not kidding, and that's the working conditions that, that people had. So the thing about it, though, is that we have this uh, wonderful shearing shed that is being now decommissioned because we have a nature refuge and an Indigenous protected area um, happening within that area. So it's a place that be can become a very uh, important uh, resource for us for all of our future works. That is, if we have researchers coming from universities um, and places, if we have um, people coming to do bird watching, if we have uh, eco-tourists happening, the potential is there. And uh, rather than us going, yeah, we know what the answer is, we're throwing the challenge out to you, say, bring us some ideas. What do you think you can do with this, this uh, wonderful old shearing shed? And the other thing is that it's, it's a marrying, I guess, of, of two very important things in the path to reconciliation that we're involved in this country, um, those of us who believe in that, of course, is that um, it's an opportunity to marry the historical connection of country, that is the European history, with the Aboriginal connection to that piece of uh, infrastructure, which has become a shearing shed where a lot of Aboriginal people came and worked and spent time. And uh, once you see the photos, 
when it rains, there's this beautiful wetland that sits not far from it. So the, dr the red earth and the dry earth becomes this really magical place. And I'm hoping that we can share some of that magic through to you. Um, I think it's really important for us to get a lot of visuals happening through this, Dan. I'll tell you a quick story about Dan when I first met Dan. Dan came to Murramur and we just had all the Melbourne water people come. Now, Dan, very, very committed, wonderful IT person, knows it all, right? Got off the bus. All he wanted to do is fill out the paperwork. Cheryl, we've got it. We've got to sit down. We've got all of this stuff. I've got all of these questions that I've got to ask you. Now, as soon as anyone does that to me, I go, oh, OK. <laughs> so we kind of, oh, too busy. Can't do it today, Dan. <laughs> too busy. Can't do it tomorrow, Dan. I was nearly Next in tears. Next day comes. He was almost crying. I could feel his pain. I could feel the hurt. I could feel the anguish happening with Dan, you know. And... When I thought it was time, I thought, yeah, he's starting to actually... I think he can hear the birds this morning. <laughs> so I thought, OK, we'll do it today. <laughs> and that's the importance of country. The importance of this challenge as well, I think, for me and for all of our people is to try and <coughs> encourage people, black or white or whatever nationality you are, to learn how to reconnect with country, with the land and with the environment and the surrounds around you. A lot of people lose that. I've been to university, I know what it's like. Um, sitting on the lawns, you know, plotting the, uh, the revolution, that's what we used to do anyway, but <laughs> I think it's kind of changed a bit now. Um, but um, you can, you can become, uh, get into your own world of academia, or academia, I think academia's the nut, isn't it? <laughs> oh, no, it's <laughs> academia. <laughs> but um, I think it's a reality. The reality, and I love, I love the, uh, I love the design that you came up with, because I see the social impact that will have on the community, the fact that it will change people's lives, it will make people's lives simpler, more manageable, but have this wonderful resource at the end of it, and I hope that's what we achieve with the EWB challenge. So, I'm really looking forward to it. I love hard work. I love challenges <laughs> and I am, you know, I'm absolutely uh, excited to be involved with EWB with this and I hope at the end of the day I have another 7,500 foot soldiers <laughs> who know about Aboriginal Australia, who hear a bit about the real history of this country and who will understand why it's important to build a relationship with the traditional owners of this country. So, can't wait for it to happen. Can I just say that I was really annoyed at that bird because it, it woke me up. <laughs> that's, that's basically all we have. I wanted to share one final story with people, which is um, the judges and I, I were standing around talking about all the different designs and we actually came up with this amazing idea where we were actually going to combine them all in together into this one great big massive super project. We were going to have a latrine that had a biodigestion system attached to it which would be on a floating land project with a communally anchored storage system and there was going to be all these houses around it with water filtration and everything. And like, it, it was amazing, it was going to be awesome. And all of that stuff came from first year engineering students which I think is, is absolutely brilliant. So thank you very much.